everyone, it's me, Lady Ada, here at the Adafruit Factory. I'd like to welcome you to the first episode of our new series. This is Adafruit and DigiKey's All the Internet of Things, a six-part video series covering everything you need to know about the Internet of Things. For our first video, we will go over the most popular transports used in the IoT industry, as well as the upsides and downsides of each type of transport to help you decide what you'll use to connect your devices to the internet. The Internet of Things is all about connections. Connecting your electronics design, product, or project to the wider world. So you have a thing and you want to connect it to the Internet of. How do you do that? As a maker, engineer, or designer, there are a lot of choices to make. And those choices have a big impact on the cost, size, runtime, and usability of your thing. Thinking and knowing about your options early on, perhaps even before you open up your ID or CAD tool, will help you save money, time, and make your product the best it can be. So, whether you plan to use Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or cellular, RFID, satellites, sub-gigahertz, LoRa, or mesh networks. The choices are abundant, and which you pick will have different features, constraints, and considerations. It's all about trade-offs. Need a lot of power or range? Are you pushing a lot of data, or do you only need small packets? Lower power, not so far away? That's why this video is all about transports. Power, distance, and bits. ancient protocol has withstood the test of time. You almost certainly use Ethernet at home and at work. Ethernet has a standardized connector, the venerable RJ45. When you need something to just work, often a wire will do that. Now, just because it's IoT doesn't mean it's wireless, it just happens that many things are wireless. But the good things about Ethernet are it's worldwide universal. It's a completely open and free standard. There's no patents, no licensing. Just about every hotel, home, and office has an Ethernet port for connecting to the Internet already. It's high speed. One gigabit per second Ethernet is available on many routers and on some single board computers. Even the slowest 10 base T Ethernet has better high speed throughput than legacy Wi Fi like 802.11 B or G. There's no interference from other wireless protocols, no dropouts. A reasonably designed NIC won't suffer from flakiness. It can go up to 100 meters on a single cable. There's no passwords, username, pairing. You just plug it in and go. It's fairly inexpensive to implement. Many chips have a built-in Ethernet Mac, so you only need a five and a plug. It can be used as a private internet or connect directly to the worldwide internet. There's some downsides. Well, of course, it requires a permanent cable connection. There's high current draw. Now you're gonna expect 200 to 300 milliamps at all times. There's a large and chunky connector, so if your project has to be small, it's not going to fit. Watch out for default passwords on things that plug in directly to the internet. Now, the biggest benefit of Ethernet is that high speed and plug and play capability. Now, there's no SSIDs, no configuration, no pairing, passwords. There are some security considerations, and we'll get into security later. But there are some benefits of just having a wire, since somebody will need physical access to tap or connect to Ethernet. And if you have a wire and a Mac assigned IP address, you generally have more control over what and who can access something. Just don't use default passwords on your IoT devices and expose them to the outside internet without being smart about security. As we mentioned, Ethernet is really fast. It can range from 10 megabits per second to one gigabit per second. 10 base T is what you'll find on small microcontrollers. 100 megabits per second is found on some higher power microcontrollers or single board computers and one gigabit per second is what you'll find on high-end equipment that needs to stream a lot of data. Now compare that with future transports we'll discuss. Some of those are specified in bits per second or kilobits per second, not megabits per second. Ethernet is generally used when you do not need a lot of range, I mean, you're stuck with the length of the cable after all, and you need to move around a lot of bits. Common Ethernet connected IoT devices are cameras, video cameras especially, which have gone to 720 or 1080p, that can strain Wi-Fi connections. VoIP, voice over IP boxes. 
game systems, industrial equipment that's permanently installed, devices that need air gap security and cannot use wireless connectivity, and high reliability control like industrial control, robotics, or medical. One downside of Ethernet is that it's fairly high current draw, and you'll need to budget 200 to 300 milliamps of constant current available during listen and transmit. However, since you're running a wire anyways for an Ethernet device, usually you can plug in power as well, or you can try power over Ethernet, PoE. PoE is a network standard that puts 48 volts on the unused data wires. This allows the network cables to carry data and power. IP cameras and VoIP phones are where you'll see most of this action. PoE routers are becoming fairly common and they're very affordable. You can add PoE to your design with extra chips and hardware. Hopefully the device you have can do the transport negotiations to turn on PoE. Or you can use a PoE converter, which will split the ethernet and power into two plugs. You know Wi-Fi. Use it all day, every day. It's the standard wireless protocol for connecting to the internet. It's available not only in home and work, but also in stores, cafes, planes, trains, and in most major cities. Wi-Fi has a lot of the benefits of Ethernet, but it's wireless. And you'll often find that devices that support one support the other. Wi-Fi has gone through many iterations, 802.11a, b, g, n, and the speed and throughput has increased in time. Like Ethernet, it can transport lots of data really fast, and it can connect to the wider internet with ease. And like Ethernet, Wi-Fi can also require a significant power budget if not managed carefully. Wi-Fi removes the need for wire for the bits, but you'll still need to power it somehow. So many IoT devices, from sensors to cameras, use Wi-Fi for the data, but then are still plugged in for power. If you're indoors, you may find that wall outlets are plentiful, but dragging an Ethernet cable is unnecessary. For mobile applications, Wi-Fi can go hours and maybe even days on battery. You'll just need to make sure you're in range of that access point and have a plan to recharge. With Wi-Fi, you can get about 150 feet of range, 50 meters indoors. Outside, maybe 300 feet, 100 meters. But as you're probably aware, the further you get from that access point, the flakier the connection will get, and the more power you will need to amplify the radio transmitter. You can save power with strategies like putting the device to sleep, waking when needed only, or just setting up specific times to turn on the Wi-Fi and do your thing. But that will all require a lot of your engineering time. Just as Ethernet comes in a few speed ratings, like 10 base T, 100 base T, and 1 gigabit, Wi-Fi also comes in various ratings. There's also 2.4 gigahertz and 5.8 gigahertz flavors. There's 802.11 A, B, G, N, A, C. Although, honestly, we've never really seen 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi on a microcontroller. With each flavor, you'll get more bits per second, but you'll need more power, and you'll often get less range. There's also different encryption standards to watch out for. 802.11b is a little old, but still available. G and N are the most common. Just keep in mind that this 2.4 gigahertz spectrum is available to anyone to use. So expect some interference from other devices like wireless keyboards, microwaves, other Wi-Fi devices, etc. 802.11b has a max data rate of about 11 megabits per second. It uses that 2.4 gigahertz band, so expect some interference. 802.11b tends to have a longer range, but at lower speeds. 802.11g also uses 2.4 gigahertz, up to 50 megabits per second, although usually you'll get about 20 megabits per second. 802.11n is also 2.4 gigahertz, but you can get up to 500 megabits per second. And 802.11ac uses 5 gigahertz, not that crowded 2.4 gigahertz space, and you'll get over 1 gigabits per second. But you'll get less range because of that higher frequency, and of course, more speed will cost more, and often will require more power. Here are some of the good things about Wi-Fi. One, it's wireless. It's worldwide universal. It's a completely open and free standard. So there's no licensing requirements. Networks and routers are available anywhere and everywhere. There is some pretty good security and encryption built in, so make sure you use it. Wi-Fi can be used as an ad hoc network or can be connected to the wider internet. It's got fairly good range, high throughput. There's popular implementations all over. 
including some very low cost versions of chips. Direct internet access is pretty much a given, and it's pretty cheap. Wi-Fi modules are only a few dollars per unit. Sometimes you can even get the microcontroller and Wi-Fi chip all in one to save space and money. But Wi-Fi has some challenges as well. Biggest challenge is it requires authentication, which can be frustrating to set up. You have to authenticate each time you get to a new access point. There's high power usage unless you do a lot of work to manage it. There's a wide range of embedded access chipsets, so you're going to have to choose which one to go with. There's flakiness and dropouts that are inherent to wireless communication. It can be challenging to debug these. And a really good Wi-Fi stack may require you to pick a real-time operating system or have a kernel that will kick the network and keep it up and running. And watch out for those default passwords on your wireless things. If it connects directly to the internet, you want to make sure you have some security on that. And of course, given that it's wireless, you'll have radio emitter certifications to think about. Especially if you have a place to plug in or easily recharge, Wi-Fi is a clear winner. It's got good range, good speeds, it's well understood. You can be certain that Wi-Fi is a protocol that is here to stay, so it's a safe bet. For portable items, it's not always the best choice as battery management can take a lot of, of your engineering time. So check your chipset and use a power monitor to compare current draw. You'll also want to use eval boards to quickly sketch out your bandwidth needs and figure out what size battery you can get away with. Some of the big frustrations with Wi-Fi are the authentication process. Now, you must absolutely have security, but that same security can make it annoying to set up the SSID and password. A common method these days that we see is the device sets up an ad hoc network so that the user can connect to it, configure the Wi-Fi, and then disconnect. It's annoying, but it's common. Another option you can go with is using Bluetooth Low Energy Configuration and then an app that sets up the Wi-Fi. If you get Bailey for free with your Wi-Fi chip, it's a pretty good deal. This authentication process can make portability annoying if there's no UI for setting the SSID and password directly on the device. Also, some schools and offices have enterprise Wi-Fi, where a term of service has to be clicked through. And that might not be possible for you to do on your small device. So you'd have to tell the administrator to allow your MAC address through and then reconnect. And as you can tell, it gets pretty hairy pretty fast. Also, since you're using wireless, your device is a radio emitter and a powerful one at that. So you'll need to spend some time and money on your wireless certification process. For example, in the US, you'll need FCC certification. In Europe, CE. In Japan, Telec, et cetera, et cetera. You can save time by going with a pre-certified module. These often have pre-tuned antennas, and they work out of the box. And so less certification is required. But you'll pay more. That said, almost every design we've seen with Wi-Fi has started with a pre-certified module. The prices for embedded Wi-Fi modules and chips have dropped dramatically in the last few years. What used to be $20 per module is now trending towards $5 per module or even less. We're also starting to see modules where the Wi-Fi component is controlled by an internal RTOS. So you may be able to get away with a single chip solution rather than a bi-chip solution. That will do wonders for your bill of material costs. But watch out that you're not getting stuck with a chip core that hamstrings you. We expect to see dozens more of these fully integrated Wi-Fi chips in the next few years. So look around to see what's available. Bluetooth is a newer protocol, but one that you're likely familiar with because it has gained a lot of popularity with gadgets and small devices. Like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth is wireless. And like Wi-Fi, it operates in the 2.4 gigahertz band. So pretty much anyone can use it and does. In fact, the frequency sharing of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth is why just about every mobile phone, tablet, computer, and laptop that has Wi-Fi also has Bluetooth. Watch out. There are two Bluetooths, and these really trip people up. There is classic Bluetooth and Bluetooth Low Energy, BTLE, BLE. BLE is sometimes referred to as Bluetooth Smart, but honestly, we just hear people say BLE, Bluetooth 4, or Bluetooth. That confusion trips people up the first time they work on Bluetooth, so just keep them straight. Range is about the same for both classic and low energy versions. Technically, the max range is about 300 feet, 100 meters, but that's very generous, and it assumes a very powerful radio. In reality, you'll find about 10 to 20 meters of range. 
and beyond that can get a little challenging. You'll get about two megabits per second max for Bluetooth Classic and less than a megabit per second for BLE. Compare that with Wi-Fi's bandwidth and range. But Bluetooth Classic and BLE are completely different protocols and they're not compatible. There are some radio chips that can do both, but be sure to check those specs before quoting that part. There are some overlaps between Classic and Low Energy. Both use 2.4 gigahertz and are intended for short hop wireless communications. For example, wireless keyboards and mice, headsets, smartwatches. The idea behind Bluetooth Low Energy was to keep the range of Classic, but use a lot less power, the low energy part. And we add some more features. For example, some of the newer features in BLE are beacons that can broadcast information. So when you fire up your phone, the beacon will tell you about itself. These are often set up with apps to do building scale location services. Even though Classic is no longer being actively developed, you'll still see it used for some purposes. For example, audio devices like wireless headset and speakers are almost always Classic. There's a push to get some of these devices moved to BLE, but it hasn't happened yet due to the lower data rates specified in Bluetooth 4. Version 5 will hopefully fix that. Wireless keyboards and mice can either be classic or Bluetooth low energy. It depends on when it was made. But you'll find that many still use Bluetooth classic because production is already in progress or because the classic chipsets are less expensive. For example, this selfie stick uses a small Bluetooth Classic chip to send a single key press. Bluetooth Classic can also do generic data transmission using the SPP serial port service. But SPP has fallen out of favor lately, mostly because it is unavailable for iOS developers without a lot of Apple side licensing efforts. Basically, if you want to do short hop data transmission, just go with BLE. Classic Bluetooth current draws maybe 20 to 30 milliamps and Classic chips don't sleep well. Bluetooth Low Energy is the newer version of Bluetooth. As we mentioned, it is not backwards compatible with Classic, but it does add a few things like lower power and more sleep modes. It also has fast pair and connection times. But version four of Bluetooth Low Energy has less bandwidth. The coming soon version of five will change this, so look out for that. Because BLE pairs fast, you can sleep until it's time to connect and transmit data, and the user often even can't tell. For IoT, BLE devices can run easily for weeks, months, or even a year on a small coin cell battery. Your fitness monitor, for example, runs on BLE. It only has to sync wirelessly to your phone once a day, so it puts the radio to sleep until then, and then it starts up, does the data sync fast, and goes back to sleep to conserve power. In BLE beacon mode, where it's only transmitting a short burst of data every few seconds, a year's lifetime is easy to budget. You can transmit a couple dozen bytes in a beacon burst, which may be enough for your sensor data. The biggest reason BLE has taken off is that Apple allows anyone to create a BLE-capable app and pair with their hardware. It's pretty much the only way you can connect to hardware with an iOS device without licensing, special programs, or an NDA. This has pushed vast numbers of developers over to BLE and has thus created a massive ecosystem of chip manufacturers, stacks, and code examples. And this is good for you, the developer. Note that for both classic and low energy, you will have a controller, AKA a central, and clients, often called peripherals. So it's a point to multi-point setup. It is possible to set up some BLE chipsets to be in both central or peripheral mode, for point-to-point -point links, but check your docs because not all chipsets can do it. One of the nice things about BLE is the number of chips that support it have grown a lot. So there's a lot of great options for BLE, whereas for Bluetooth Classic, the development environment, documentation options were very limited. If you have to make a choice between the two, consider supporting BLE only. Here are some of the pros. BLE is very low power. It's supported by just about every tablet, phone, laptop, and most PCs. It's good for short hops, up to about 20 meters. BLE is fairly reliable for pairing, and with 5.0, it can be pretty fast. BLE beacon mode may be all that you need, but watch out, it's clear text. All-in-one chipsets have improved a great deal, and they don't cost very much. The latest BLE 5.0 chipsets can do multi-point and mesh networking. They're also a lot faster than 4.0 chipsets, so check your chip docs. Here are some things to watch out for. 
you may need to add and verify your own security. Unlike Wi-Fi, many BLE stacks are often unencrypted by default. BLE is not connected directly to the internet, so you may need to set up a gateway. You may need to pay a Bluetooth special interest group fee per device. Some operating system support is weak, especially pre-Windows 7 and Linux. Keep in mind, Bluetooth doesn't connect directly to the internet like Wi-Fi and Ethernet does. If you think about it, Wi-Fi goes through the router. For Bluetooth, you'll need to set up your own router to send data via Wi-Fi, Ethernet, cellular, etc. Since almost every Bluetooth device has both BLE and cellular or Wi-Fi, oftentimes those handheld devices are used as an internet bridge. The biggest downside we've seen to BLE is that desktop OS support for everything but audio and keyboard lags behind the mobile support. Because so many BLE devices connect to mobile, the Android and iOS support may be easier to implement and better supported than Linux and Windows and Mac. Oftentimes, hardware developers just decide that the only way to communicate with their gadget is through a cell phone. There is a slow but steady push to have web Bluetooth as a cross-platform wireless interface, but that isn't finished yet and it's not rolled out. This may not matter to you depending on your use case, but if you expect users to interact using their PCs, be sure to allocate plenty of time to develop a multi-platform solution. Of the three transports we've discussed so far, they have one thing in common. They all require a hub, a router, or central that is nearby. So even if they don't have physical wires, there's a range tether. They are best used indoors or in a controlled environment. But if you need the ultimate range, cellular and satellite technology is where it's at. As you're well aware, cell phones can go just about anywhere. There are cell towers across every country and almost anywhere there are people. And cellular towers can be very powerful. When coupled with a high power transceiver on your device, range can easily hit miles away. But as you probably know from your cell phone's battery life, power management is a big concern. In order to reach those towers, cellular radios can draw watts of power, and you can see current spikes of two amps or more. Historically, cellular was designed only for audio use, but cellular technology moves really fast. Whereas a decade ago, we could only really send emails and SMS messages, it is now commonplace to transmit full videos and large files. You may not need that kind of bandwidth, but it's good to know it's there. There are a few choices for cellular. The current generation is LTE, long-term evolution, 4G and 5G, and that's what new designs should target. However, you will still see some 3G chipsets and the ancient 2G GSM standard is still kicking around. The biggest downside to cellular, apart from the high current draw, is cost. Cellular modules are going to be more expensive than Wi-Fi or Bluetooth and you have to use a module in order to get cell network certified. And no matter what, you're going to need a cell network provider. You'll have to pay monthly for access and data usage. Watch out for low-cost GSM cellular modules. GSM is also called 2G or sometimes GPRS. It provides 200 or so kilobit per second data rate, but is already being shut down or has been shut down in many countries. In the US, AT&T has already reassigned their bandwidth. T-Mobile is the only other GSM provider, and they've indicated we only have until about 2020 guaranteed. But there are millions of old GSM devices, so you may see that deadline inch along for a little bit longer. That said, if you have a project that operates in another country, and that country is still primarily on GSM, the modules for cellular GSM are smaller, lower power, and the data rates are pretty inexpensive. One nice thing about GSM chips is they tend to be quad band and will work in any country. So you can develop in the USA and then send it abroad or vice versa. There are also many 3G cellular modules available now. These tend to be a little bit larger, higher priced and higher power, but they're still very reasonably priced. 3G will get you a few megabits per second data rate and major carriers have not announced any plan to shut down 3G services, so you should be good for at least five to 10 years. One thing to watch out for is most of these modules are based on technology that can only be used in one region at a time. So you may have to pick different modules if you're using them in the Americas, Europe, or Asia. 
If you're starting a design now, you may want to consider LTE, sometimes called 4G or 5G. One nice thing about LTE is that it has been thought through with respect to IoT. So rather than sort of grafting onto GPRS or 3G data and sharing the same technology stack as cell phones, there are different categories to LTE. The categories basically range from zero to nine. Zero is the slowest and lowest power, least expensive, and nine is the highest speed. To make it a little bit more confusing, what would have been called CAT zero technology is referred to as CAT M, where M is for machine. What this means is that if you want to send sensor data once a week from a remote farmhouse, you can go with a low category modem, say CAT M or CAT 1, and you don't have to spend the same amount of money and power on a cellular modem that you would use for streaming high speed video like CAT 6, 7, or 8. Right now, category 2 and higher is deployed worldwide wherever 4G is available. CAT 1 is available in North America and is rolling out worldwide. And CAT M, which is best used for low bandwidth machine to machine, is being rolled out right now. There's a couple different subcategories within CAT M as well. Since this technology is advancing so fast, you'll want to check with your favorite module manufacturers and carriers to see what's available. Here's some cellular pros. There's around the world off-grid range, direct internet connectivity, direct SMS and voice connectivity, which is unique compared to other transports. It's fairly reliable. The cellular network is maintained by others, so you don't have to take care of it. Security is built in. 3G and 4G cellular network are well encrypted, and you can use SSL when going onto the internet. And you can do some rough geolocation based on the local cell phone towers. Here are some cellular considerations to keep in mind. The modules can be expensive and large, but you have to use modules. They have very high power usage. Frequency ranges change in different countries. You'll need a carrier to set up access. There are monthly and oftentimes per megabyte charges. Network coverage can vary from location to location and country to country. You have to commit to a network. 2G is cheap but discontinued. 3G is common but more expensive. LT is on the horizon but not fully deployed for all machine-to-machine -machine usage. And if you're using 2G, there are some security issues. And either way, cell phone numbers can be spoofed. Satellite technology is sort of like cellular, so we're going to cover it briefly here, even though it's not technically the same. When you're not near a cell tower, like you're in the middle of the ocean, in the wilderness, far from civilization, or if you need worldwide functionality guaranteed, how can you get your thing communicating? Sensors, transportation, scientific data capture, search and rescue, these situations might stick you in the middle of nowhere. And for those situations where you have very little data you have to manage and transport, satellite linkups may work very well. Note that this is a very constrained transport. For civilian uses, you will be using the Iridium Satellite Constellation. You'll pay a lot for the technology. It's huge. It takes a lot of power, and you'll also pay per month and per message. Of course, there's a lot of downsides, but if you absolutely need to communicate from anywhere in the world without needing to set up your own bridge, relay, or network, this is the only option you've got. Now we're getting into setups where you have to run your own network. Remember, with Ethernet, Wi-Fi, cellular, and satellite, you've got an existing network and you're joining as a client. With Bluetooth Low Energy, your phone or computer can act as the network manager. Zigbee and Z-Wave, as well as other similar low-power radios, such as XB, are often used for home or office-scale networks and automation. These are low-power radios so great for battery usage. But more importantly, they are usable in mesh and high density point multipoint or multipoint multipoint networks, something Bluetooth Low Energy does not yet do very well. These two transports, despite both starting with Z and both used for home and industrial automation, have nothing to do with each other. Zigbee 802.15.4 
is available in both 900 megahertz and 2.4 gigahertz frequencies, though you'll most often see it as 2.4 gigahertz. It shares some of the same frequencies as Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and is a freely available standard with dozens of chips available and a flexible protocol. You can use existing profiles like the Zigbee Light Link or just make your own. Zigbee is cheap, cheaper than Wi-Fi, and to connect it to the internet, you'll need a gateway. So, for example, Philips Hue bulbs have a Zigbee chipset inside that does both the radio and LED control. All of the light bulbs in the house talk to a gateway hub, which has both Zigbee and Wi-Fi or Ethernet. All of the switches, LEDs, and controls talk to that same hub. That hub then connects to the internet or is just used within the home without external access. Z-Wave is a more constrained use protocol. It's designed for home use and automation, and to make equivalent devices, you have to buy chips from the single supplier. It's a 900 megahertz standard, so you get a little bit more range than 2.4 gigahertz Zigbee. This is especially true in industrial or urban environments, since sub-gigahertz penetrates brick and concrete better than 2.4 gigahertz. The big benefit of going with Z-Wave is you're joining 100 other companies that provide cross-compatible support. The big downside is you're stuck with a very proprietary protocol. Even though some parts have been open sourced, you're still marrying a single company. Compare that to the dozen suppliers of Zigbee chips and multiple Zigbee stacks available. That said, you may want to compare Bluetooth or Energy 5.0 and Zigbee when designing your low power radio device. BLE5 is gaining more Zigbee-like capabilities than the other way around, and you may be able to use it. Here's some pros. Zigbee and Z-Wave are very low cost and very low power. The Zigbee 802.15.4 stacks are popular and available from multiple vendors. Many even bundle a full microcontroller with it. Zigbee profiles may make your design easy. For example, ZLL for Lightlink or HA for home automation. Examples abound. You may be able to join existing home area networks if you maintain compatibility. You may be able to use mesh networking. These protocols do have some downsides. You're going to need a gateway for internet access, and you'll need to manage your own network. Z-Wave chips are only available from one supplier. For both protocols, you may need to join an alliance or pay into a proprietary network to maintain compatibility. There is some security built in, but you may need to roll your own or add some authentication if the built-in security isn't good enough for your application. So far, we've covered plenty of short hop radios, like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, and Z-Wave. And next up are their big sisters, the medium hop radios. These radio transports take the same idea of a self-controlled wireless network and give you much longer ranges. Since they have wide range and low power, they are often called LP-WANs for low power wide area networks. LP-WAN devices are not new. In fact, cellular is essentially a nation-sized version of one. But for people who don't want to tie into the cellular network and they don't need that bandwidth, LP-WANs can give you excellent range for very little power and not very much money. These networks can reach for many miles outdoors, even in high-density cities. They're perfect in countryside, rural, and semi-urban spots, especially if you have the ability to set up directional antennas in a high spot. What's great about all these LP-WANs is there's no complex pairing, connection, or authentication overhead unless you want it. So you can wake up your setup and start transmitting within milliseconds. There's three common LP-WAN solutions, two commercial and one generic. The first commercial LP-WAN we'll talk about is called LoRa, which stands for long range. Sometimes this is referred to as LoRaWAN when the controlling protocol layer is added on. LoRa uses any frequency. It's more of a frequency hopping transport, but it tends to be used at 315, 433, 868, and 900 megahertz ISM bands. LoRa has very little structure. It's just for sending and receiving packets of data. The retransmission and link management is all on you. You can have more network management control if you'd like by adding LoRaWAN. Like Zigbee, you're on your own to create the network and manage routers, bridges, etc. But there are some cities that have full networks set up already, much like the radio relays that amateur hams have used. LoRa is patented 
and the radio chips are only manufactured via Semtech, but they're bundled into modules by many other companies. They're much cheaper than cellular, but a little bit more expensive than Bluetooth or Zigbee. And they do need to be controlled by a microcontroller. You can also get full LoRaWAN modules that make connecting up to a LoRaWAN network super easy. Here are some of the good things about LoRa. It's free to use, so you can set up your own network whenever and wherever you like. You can send as many messages as you like at good speeds, up to about 50 kilobits per second. It's very long range. You can get a few kilometers in cities and up to 40 kilometers in rural areas when you use directional antennas. LoRa is fairly low power depending on your radio amplification. Not as low power as BLE, but much better than cellular and Wi-Fi. You can pick and choose any frequency you are legally permitted to use. LoRa does have some downsides. First up, you must manage your own network and gateway. It's all on you. And the chips are only available from Semtech and they're under patent. Sigfox is a similar LPWAN radio protocol, but closer in cellular networking style. Rather than set up your own LoRa network, Sigfox is an existing network set up by the self-named company. You can only use Sigfox chips in a location where there's an existing Sigfox network set up, but many cities already have one. After you've registered and paid, you can join the network, send and receive data. Here are the good things about Sigfox. That backend network is already taken care of for you. And it's very long range, even a little bit longer range than LoRa. You can get easily a few kilometers in cities, up to 40 or 50 kilometers in rural areas with directional antennas. And it's very low power. There are a couple downsides to using Sigfox. First up, like we said, it's a paid subscription service. You have to pay Sigfox to use the Sigfox network. And that long range is traded off with bandwidth. It's ultra slow, only 100 bytes a second. And it's not available everywhere, so you'll have to check if there's a network provider where you are deploying your Sigfox device. The limited messages can really bite you. Only 140 12 byte upload and 4 times 8 byte download messages per day. And it's a fixed frequency per location, so you have to go with what's available by your provider. LoRa and Sigfox are fairly new, but they fill an important need where you need very low bandwidth and very high ranges. Even with Sigfox pricing, it's way cheaper than managing a SIM card for each device. And compared to cellular, the power draw is minimal. Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and satellite were not made for millions of low-power devices all whispering to each other around the clock, but LP WANs are. There is a third option for those who want long range and maybe don't want or need to use LoRa or Sigfox at all. Just roll your own. For example, Gotenna used a Scilab's SI4460 transceiver to create a 100 MHz radio network. That low frequency allowed them to get awesome range for point-to-point -point links. Some makers also like using modules that use FSK or similar radios, such as the Semtec SX1231 or a number of others. Managing these is a little bit like LoRa, you have to set up your own network and gateway. But with generic FSK-like radios, you're not even required to pay up for the LoRa patent licensing, so they're very inexpensive for the range you get. Some radios even come with built-in encryption and link management assistance, so you get stuff like CRCs, retransmission, and node addressing. The simplicity of these radios is that you can stay in sleep mode for as long as you need, until you want to wake up and transmit. And like other radios, you don't need to pair or authenticate unless you want to. Many of these latter mentioned protocols will need gateways. A gateway is what manages the data from the IoT device and gets it to and from the internet. So you'll also have to come up with the transport for the gateway. You may end up with more than one transport in that case. For example, your IoT device may use Bluetooth Low Energy, and then you could have a cell phone perform the Bluetooth Low Energy to cellular or Wi-Fi gateway. Or, for Zigbee, a home router or custom router can convert Zigbee to Ethernet to upload it via router. Also, check out some of the specialized IoT platforms and chips available. Many of them can now support multiple transports, such as NFC and BLE, or BLE and Wi-Fi, or LoRa and Cellular, and that can make your gateway development process a breeze.